Tonight, there's still time to make it count, but census advocates say you'd better hurry. Plus, the market is closed. A summertime tradition can't compete with COVID-caused restrictions. And later, a new crop of teachers comes to class under unusual circumstances. From Montana's news leader, this is the MTN 10 o'clock news. Thanks for trusting MTN tonight. I'm Tim McGonigal. Keely Van Mittendorp is off. Earlier this week, the U.S. Census Bureau announced it will stop its counting efforts for the 2020 census on September 30th, a month earlier than originally planned. For Montana, that's not good news. Thousands of Montanans are likely to go uncounted. State officials are asking the feds to reconsider the deadline. MTN's Mike Dennison has more. As of this week, only 56% of Montana households had responded to the 2020 census one of the lowest response rates in the nation. Montana has a plan to reach those who haven't replied, but that plan was based on an October 31st deadline. If that deadline is sooner, state officials are worried Montana's count will be inaccurately low, and that means federal aid and other benefits will be cut short for the next decade. It is very important uh, that we get an accurate count because if we don't get an accurate count, that just means those dollars aren't gonna come here and it's gonna go someplace else, to some other state. The Census Bureau announced Monday it's stopping the count on September 30th, so it can meet a December 31st deadline for getting the numbers compiled. Both of Montana's U.S. Senators and Governor Bullock have demanded that the Bureau reverse its decision. Montana also had hoped to gain a new congressional seat next year because of its population growth the past 10 years. But if the count is incomplete, officials say that gain is unlikely. Cooney, who chairs the state Complete Count Committee, says the census doesn't mail notices to post office boxes or rural route addresses. That's as many as 25% of Montanans. But the coronavirus pandemic has restricted other efforts to reach those who didn't get a mailed notice. The state hired several groups to conduct outreach, but they expected to have more time. And if people don't contact the census by the deadline? They're not counted. Huh? It's just that simple. We just, they don't exist in the eyes of the census. It means that, you know, if one person is not counted, Montana loses about $20,000 over a 10 year period. And when you start adding that up, so if it's 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 1,000 people who don't get counted, starts to add up to be real money for the state of Montana. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. Well, what started out as a nice sunny day uh, turned fairly active in parts of the viewing area, and it's still that way in many parts. For our first look at the weather, we send it over to Curtis in the Storm Tracker Weather Center. Yes, yeah, sunny start did not end that way here as thunderstorms have been rumbling across parts of the state. Not everybody seeing the storms, but take a look at the radar here and storms pushing through Cascade County, Judith Basin County, get ready, Shoto County. Although the storms are beginning to weaken somewhat here, this is the same line that came up through uh, Butte and the Helena area working their way right up Interstate 15. The rain, if you're seeing that rain, it is so nice, right? But the lightning strikes, hundreds and hundreds of lightning strikes uh, throughout the western part of the state. And again, some of these strikes going over areas of uh, forest that have heavily killed beetle uh, trees uh, in them. So something to watch out for this Friday, a fire weather watch here for this entire area. Elevated fire danger here after these storms go through another few rounds of thunderstorms over the next 24 to 36 hours. We'll talk more about fiery Friday and what a weekend it will be. I'll have more on the full forecast coming up. All right, thanks, Curtis. Checking Montana's COVID-19 numbers. The state reported 115 new cases since Tuesday. Phillips County has seen its first cases of coronavirus with five meaning masks are now mandatory in the county. There has also been another COVID-related death in Yellowstone County. That brings the statewide total to 66. There are currently more than 1,500 active cases and 79 Montanans are hospitalized. Well, as of today, the uh, Helena Farmers Market is officially canceled for the season. Following the revocation of the market's COVID-19 prevention plan and street permit, the market's board and Lewis and Clark Public Health tried to find a way to keep the market running while still abiding by the county's guidelines. Helena's Farmers Market Board President Wayne O'Brien said the organization just didn't feel like they had the ability to carry out a plan under the guidelines. When we finally, I think, got to a point where we thought we could put something together 
that would work, we realized that we just did not have the manpower or the capability and real difficult for us to deal with trying to have a farmer's market where you're limited to 250 people for the entire day that you hold the market. It just didn't seem feasible for us at that stage of the game to move forward. Lewis and Clark Public Health called the decision to cancel the market heartbreaking. In a statement, they said, quote, we had hoped for an amended plan that would allow community members access to the wonderful local products our vendors have to offer in a safe environment protective from the virus that causes COVID-19. Great Falls Public Schools are ramping up for an unprecedented fall semester. Despite the pandemic, 51 new teachers are slated to start this fall in the district. MTN's Zach Shermley checked in with a few to see how they're feeling. The clock is ticking for the start of the school year here in the Electric City, with teachers still reeling from the fallout of last spring's online-only semester. And last year, there was nothing really I could contribute once they called off school. Paul Jefferson, an in-school suspension tutor at Great Falls High, resigned ahead of the upcoming school year. So much of what I do is my um, connections with the kids, and none of that was going to be possible. I have been teaching at Great Falls High for 31 years, and now it's a pandemic. Also last semester, retirements from longtime Great Falls High teachers Christina Thiel and Jan Mater. 43 years ago, I came to Great Falls. Despite the pandemic, district officials tell MTN the turnover is largely on par with any other year. This year's passing of the torch comes with much more uncertainty, especially for special education teachers like Holly Johnson, who will be at Valley View Elementary this fall. It's an unsure time. Um, we're all going through unsure times with this whole pandemic. As a special ed teacher, um, our classrooms look a lot different. 22 teachers retired from the Great Falls Public School District last semester, passing the baton to Holly here at Valley View Elementary, along with 50 other new hires for the district. Despite the uncertainty, many new educators tell me they have no other choice but to remain optimistic. All of us are doing the best we can. <laughs> so we'll keep things clean and sanitized to keep everybody healthy and especially as health enhancement, that's, that's our goal. Health enhancement teacher Molly Harding says she's thankful for the level of communication from the district. GFPS has done a really awesome job with preparing us for everything and they've been so great about telling us information and making us feel like we're included in everything. In July, the district released a draft plan for a mix of face-to-face -face and remote instruction in the fall, with protections for immunocompromised students and staff members. Regardless of what next school year brings, Holly says she and her students are in this together. Honestly, the thing that gets me to the next day and that makes my attitude still positive is that just being with my students, just having that one-to-one um, -one, um, contact with my students is what is keeping me going. In Great Falls, Zach Shermley, MTN News. The University of Montana has come up with an idea meant to keep students and faculty safe this fall on campus. Earlier today, volunteers gathered to put together 15,000 health fall Grizz kits. Those kits include two reusable masks, a cleaning rag, disinfectant spray, and hand sanitizer. UM says the idea for, is for students to bring the kits with them around campus to protect themselves. There will be sanitizer and dis disinfectant refill stations around campus. School officials say it's just one thing they're doing to make sure the college is a safe place to be. Just wanted to give some resources and tools to um, make the transition back to campus and face-to-face -face classes a, a bit easier and um, give the students some supplies that they might not necessarily have and get them geared up at the beginning of fall. Ryle says students are excited to return this fall and providing these resources will make it easier for them. Well, during the first few weeks of the pandemic, the Salvation Army of Great Falls was helping their weekly quota of households in a single day. Now that unemployment benefits have been cut, the Salvation Army expects general need to surge once again. This increase means the nonprofit will depend on the community even more over the next few months as they work to meet the needs of struggling community members. Monetary donations, food drop offs and time spent volunteering can help the Salvation Army help others. Corps Officer Monica King explained that while the organization expects the need to increase, the staff hasn't had time to prepare for the expected demand in supplies and resources. We really haven't been able to prepare ahead, really. It's just um... It, we will continue to provide the services we've always provided until uh, those resources run 
drive, basically. As the Salvation Army gears up for another busy season, they ask that the community keep their needs in mind. If you'd like to donate or are in need of aid, you can find more information on our website. Development might be stagnant during the COVID-19 pandemic, but the future is bright. MTN's Tom Wiley has more on projects that are moving forward and what they mean for Great Falls' downtown growth. Though the global pandemic has led to an economic downturn, there was reason for optimism at Tuesday night's city commission meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oppose aye. nay. And a thank you on behalf of the city of Great Falls for the risk takers that are in the audience tonight. The commissioners unanimously approved tax abatements for three local projects currently in development. I really believe in tax abatements. It's an investment in Great Falls growth. And I think we're really sending a good message that the city will participate with growth even during times like this. The first is a proposed complex attached to the Milwaukee station that would add 83 market rate apartments, a wine bar, a food court with four to five restaurants and a possible gym. The second is a project called the Northern Lofts, which would renovate the second and third floor of the 412 Central Avenue building above the Mighty Mo Brewery into 18 one and two bedroom apartments. And the third is a multi-purpose entertainment venue with a large stage, a bar and lounge and a capacity of 700 occupants going into the vacant units next to Central Avenue Meats. All these projects are in various stages of planning with plenty of hurdles to clear before they become a reality. With the first hurdle is out of the way with city supports and that goes well for the future of Great Falls development. We've been working on downtown revitalization for a number of years now and these three projects are really the fruition of years of effort to attract high quality private investment. These projects are, are very important for the future of downtown, but they also demonstrate private investor confidence in, in the future of Great Falls and the entire economy of the Golden Triangle. Tom Wiley, MTN News. Well, the pandemic could have cost the Great Falls Municipal Band its 127 year tradition of summer shows, but the band's leading members wouldn't let their season end on a bad note. So this summer, while the municipal band performers' performances might look a little different than in years past, the show will go on as it always has. This summer's performances were broken up into smaller acts of four or so musicians so uh, to ensure that band members were socially distanced from one another. Audience members also adhered to the guidelines by sitting apart from other groups and wearing masks during the concert. While this setup is certainly a first for the group, longtime member Phil Burton says it's been a positive change for musicians and audience members alike. When you hear a big band, you don't always hear the piccolos playing all the time or the flutes playing all the time. And with these small ensembles, you get to hear them and them alone. And it's really good for the musicians because, you know, a lot of them, like myself, maybe lack some confidence on certain pieces and there's safety in numbers. Well, when you're up there with two or three others, you're not very safe. So you got to practice and work and make yourself get better. The band will perform their final concert of the summer at Gibson Park next Wednesday night at 7. I'm Sean Wells in Polson, where Flathead Lake cherries are in peak harvest. From Montana's news leader, you're watching the MTN 10 o'clock news. Welcome back. Popular Flathead Lake cherries are currently in peak harvest. They're being sold locally in grocery stores, and they're also being shipped across the world. In tonight's Montana Ag segment, MTN's Sean Wells has an update on one of Montana's sweetest summertime exports. I think a lot of the market this year is domestic because there's just a big demand for cherries, but there's overseas markets. A lot of, a lot of Northwest cherries, which we are considered part of, are sold in Asia and Europe and um, yeah, all over the world. Munson Fruit Field representative Brian Campbell expects roughly 1.2 million pounds of Flathead Lake cherries to be harvested this season. The Cherry Grower Cooperative manages 80 flathead orchards, roughly 500 acres of cherries. Campbell says the crop is roughly 60% of last year's haul, which brought in 2 million pounds. Despite the low crop outlook, Campbell says this year's fruit is in excellent condition. Campbell says long summer days and cool nights, along with a smaller than normal crop, seem to be the perfect recipe for this season's cherries. With smaller volumes, we're able to time our picking a little bit better, and so we're getting, you know, picking it right at its prime. 
We don't have to rush and try to get a bigger crop off. Flathead Lake Cherry farmer and co-op board member Mark St. Sauber says orchards are taking extra precautions this season due to the coronavirus pandemic. Free testing sites have been set up for cherry workers along with social distancing protocols. We've been taking their temperature every morning and asking them if they are, you know, having any of the symptoms of the coronavirus. Um, so far, we've had no issues. The Flathead Lake Cherry Growers Warehouse on Finley Point is where Monson Fruit Company receives the cherries and hydrocools the fruit down to 34 degrees. The fruit is then stored in a cooler before it is shipped out within hours to their packing facility in Sela, Washington. Campbell says one perk on the job is being the official cherry taste tester, helping determine when cherries are ready to be picked. I don't know how many I eat in a day, but that's a good indication of their ripeness and their quality is that taste test. So I taste a lot of cherries. Campbell said harvest started on July 25th and is expected to run through August 12th. In Pulse and Sean Wells, MTN News. I'm game for a flathead cherry eating contest if anybody else <laughs> wants in. Uh, who else is hearing rumbles of thunder out there? We'll take a look at where the storms are and where they'll be headed next. Come out. Thanks. Welcome back, everybody. Good Wednesday evening to you all. I know we've got some thunderstorms moving through parts of the state right now, but this is of uh, serious concern as we head into Friday. Fire Weather Watch is a precursor to a red flag warning. Likely it will have uh, these can, this watch upgraded to a warning as we get into uh, Friday. But uh, just watch out here. Fire danger will be maybe the worst we've seen so far this year. Not only Friday afternoon, but possibly into Saturday as well. Now throw on those thunderstorms. You can see them moving uh, through a lot of Cascade County and Shoto County, Judith Basin County here uh, as well. How about the lightning strikes? What a beautiful lightning show it has been. Uh, however, a couple of those lightning strikes, certainly not uh, good news. Possibility of uh, uh, some wildfire starts with the lightning strikes. Looks like the activity diminishing uh, here just a little bit, but a uh, nice storm just to the south of the Stanford area. A nice storm moving up into the high woods. I hiked to the top of Highwood Baldy today. Did you see me waving from the top uh, of the mountain there? Also a storm crossing the Marias River heading up uh, to about the uh, Shelby area and uh, the Capitol area. Helena clearing out here after the storms brought a lot of lightning. Look at this earlier in the afternoon. All of that lightning and again a lot of lightning strikes into forests that have a lot of standing dead trees, which is uh, certainly not good news. Red flag warnings throughout a lot of the western United States here, so it's not just Montana uh, that is looking at fire season. It's fire season for a lot of the western U.S. Now, our little disturbance going through the state right now. You can see the uh, blow up of the convection right there. Here's another little area of low pressure that is quickly approaching western Montana. That will affect us tomorrow, and then we've got a series of front you can kind of see the little dip in the jet stream and then another dip in the jet stream. Well, one front goes through Thursday night into Friday with a lot of wind, hence the high fire danger. And then there may be another one that follows quickly on Saturday, Saturday night into Sunday, keeping the wind going, keeping the fire danger going. However, the one benefit is it will bring in much cooler air here. Some of the coolest stuff we've seen in maybe over a month. Here is a look at future track and we've got a couple of those storms fizzling out as it moves up towards the high line. Uh, but I think the high line will see some thunderstorm activity tomorrow. Here we go in the morning hours, uh, a few isolated showers and storms with partly cloudy skies. But look at this by the afternoon, scattered showers and thunderstorms, maybe rounds of thunderstorms coming through, redeveloping. Could still be looking at storms at about this time tomorrow night for places like Helena and Great Falls and up here along the high line. Maybe even some storms through the overnight hours into Friday morning. And then Friday, no issues with any storms, but we will have a lot of wind for North Central Montana, hence the fire weather watch. 50s and 60s tonight, storms fizzling out. Here's the forecast for tomorrow. Scattered thunderstorms throughout a lot of the state. A little more sunshine, warming up temperatures into eastern Montana, well up into uh, the 90s. And uh, there's a look at the thunderstorm threat. Could be severe for parts of the state. And then heading into Friday, cooler temperatures, but a lot of wind. Watch that fire danger coming through here on Friday into Saturday. Also a very windy day. Sunday, those temperatures 
Nice and refreshing highs in the 70s and at the 80s and the wind dies down. Here's the seven day forecast for Great Falls. 90 tomorrow, scattered storms in the afternoon. Cool but windy with high fire danger. Friday and Saturday, Sunday, the fin finally the wind dies down. And down around the Helena area, 86 with some scattered storms throughout the day. And it will be windy with high fire danger Friday and Saturday. Thanks, Curtis. And history comes alive in Sun River. Coming up, a look at a revitalization project on a one-of-a-kind building. From Montana's news leader, you're watching the MTN 10 o'clock news. A barn in Sun River is getting a facelift, but it's not just any barn. MTN's Isaiah Dunk takes us there. The J.C. Adams Stone Barn has been a staple in the Sun River Valley for quite a while. Local rancher J.C. Adams had it completed in 1885, so it's actually older than the state of Montana. With its large size and Romanesque revival architecture, it's said to be the only barn of its kind west of the Mississippi River. He built the barn mainly to provide horses and cattle to Fort Shaw, which was going strong at that point in time. He came from Kentucky, uh, that's part of the reason why he built such a beautiful big old barn. I noticed the barn almost the first time I drove by it. It just jumps out at you. The barn fell out of private use in 1979, and it's been registered as a National Historic Place since then. Over the last four decades, it's seen numerous restoration efforts, and this week, the most recent one is finishing up. A $10,000 grant from the Montana History Foundation has helped with new red paint for all the wooden surfaces, plus restored window panes and other work. It's been wonderful, actually. Um, overwhelming in the sense that, you know, planning the, the weather, the subcontractors, the supplies, everything's kind of late coming in, but it all came together, so it went really smooth, actually. And in its heyday, the barn even held roller skate parties and dances for Valley locals up in the hayloft. Its unique size, location, and style make it worth every effort. The alternative is it not being here any longer, and you know, as it deteriorates, it's just kind of an eyesore. So, um, you know, raising the money to make this happen, and or getting a grant to do it is just so important for everybody in in this area, as well as the families that live here. Neat history and a lot of fun memories for everybody. In Sun River, Isaiah Dunk, MTN News. We'll be right back with a final look at the forecast after this. Tonight's thunderstorms are fizzling out, but there will be scattered thunderstorms throughout most of the state throughout the day on Thursday. Friday and Saturday look great right on paper, but the fire danger will be screaming here. Some of the worst fire danger we have seen all year long and for Great Falls scattered storms tomorrow afternoon. Red flag warning conditions likely met on Friday and Saturday. All right, so earlier tonight we told you about the uh, Great Falls Municipal Band. Uh, we leave you this evening with some of the sights and sounds of their performance. Have a good night.